This week on Vaticano, we're heading to Florence to explore sacred art and meet the artisans of this divine craft. Have you ever heard God's voice on earth? Catch our story on sacred music. Homeless Jesus finds a home in Rome. Meet Timothy Schmaltz, the creator of these incredible statues. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Florence, the city of art. From the 13th century to the 16th, this was the capital of the arts in Europe. Dante Alighieri, the father of the Italian language and literature, and Michelangelo, one of history's finest sculptors, were both born here. And as Florence thrived, so did the rest of Europe. Inside these walls began one of the richest cultural periods in human history, the Renaissance. Brunelleschi's design for the Duomo became the prototype for the Dome of St. Peter's in the Vatican. Today, the city is an active center of culture that keeps its traditions alive. And it was right here that the Firenze Sacred Art School was born. A school that gathers artists, theologians, craftsmen, and students all brought together for the same goal, to express their faith through art. The school was born five years ago. The idea came to a young Irish sculptor, Donnick McManus. He realized that what sacred art has managed to do for many centuries is to draw people closer to faith, to the sacraments, to the mystery, and to prayer. And he also realized that today, too, we need to mold a new generation of artists and craftsmen able to present beauty in what's sacred. The director of the Sacred Art School, Firenze, Giorgio Fozzati, is convinced that a solid education is the key point for the quality of the artworks. We have chosen three important chapters. The Theology of the Body by John Paul II, The Spirit of the Liturgy by Benedict XVI, and George Steiner's Theory of Real Presences. We decided to put these three as the foundations of the school because we want the training we offer to be deep and accurate. Accurata, molto profonda. The school is an international institution. Most of the students are from Italy, but there's quite a big number of foreigners as well. In truth, every person is welcome here to study. The only requisite is a commitment to the school's aim, which is very precise, producing sacred art. We want to connect people, their souls, to God, to the mystery, and help them pray. Sacred art is just a mean to help people to, to be in relation with God. So there is an end. There is uh, something that is not just the freedom of art, but it's something bigger. Benedict XVI distinguishes between sacred art and religious art. Sacred art abides by some rules and the artist's job is to stick to them. Actually, Benedict XVI goes as far as saying that the artist must become one with his own work, so that what comes out in the end is not the artist, but the mystery. And the more an artist can do that, and the more a work of sacred art can speak to us, convey something, and help people get closer to faith, to the sacraments, and to prayer. This is what makes sacred art so specific. It helps the liturgy, the Eucharistic celebration. This is the main object in sacred art. For sacred art, there are two kinds of sacred arts. One is related directly to liturgy, and in this case there are some rules very clear along the history of the church. There are many different rites, but there are rules. The other one is the private devotion. The 
The school follows the traditional way of teaching through apprenticeships and workshops. La nostra è una scuola bottega per cui our school is based on workshops. So our students learn new things by working. They are commissioned works. One month ago, for example, we were commissioned an altarpiece for the Church of the Lady of the Rescue in Livorno. And it was the students of the painting class who did it. Hanno fatta gli studenti del corso di pittura. I collaborated in a painting, in three paintings that we did in a school uh, that uh, have been brought in a church in Livorno, uh, a city here in Italy. And I was uh, so joyful to see uh, our paintings uh, in this church and so many people uh, that could be able to pray in front, of the, in front of it. The combination of church tradition, Florentine craft style, and contemporary techniques make this art school a unique place to study and create sacred art. Our motto is forward in tradition. We try to respect and stick to the tradition of the church, the gospel, the word of God, while trying new forms, a new artistic language, which can speak to the people of today but also to the people of tomorrow. La gente di oggi, ma anche la gente di domani. The Christian faith is centered on the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. This event opened the door to the artistic representation of God. He wanted to be seen by the people. Sacred art should be popular because Jesus Christ took flesh to save everybody. So, sacred art is not an intellectual uh, work just to say how bright am I, uh, something for, for a, sh a small group of people that are connoisseur of, of some, some high level of knowledge, should be something that everybody could understand. The school doesn't follow any particular artistic style. It teaches to open the heart to transcendental beauty. I pray in every moment <laughs> because uh, when I uh, especially when, uh, before painting, I have to uh, enter more in uh, what that painting uh, is going to be uh, in order to represent it in the best way. And then also when I painting in the process, I call to be in a strong relationship with, uh, with God uh, so that he can be the one who uh, is present in the painting. Noi abbiamo avuto molte conversioni. We've had many conversions and, surprisingly, callings too. Two of our former students have actually pursued their calling here and entered the convent as nuns while taking classes here in our school. It's very encouraging to see that sacred art can get people closer to faith. And given that this is what's happened for many centuries, it can still happen today. Although the school was established only five years ago, it's already made a name for itself thanks to the high quality of the works produced by its artists. The hiring rate of ex-students is very high, about 70%. Once, Florence was the living stage of an explosion of culture, which gave the world Michelangelo and Dante. Perhaps the School of Sacred Art is the beginning of a second renaissance that will once again change our culture and bring the sacred into contemporary art. During the celebration of Holy Mass, all of the senses of the faithful are involved. St. John Chrysostom said, when Mass is being celebrated, the sanctuary is filled with countless angels who adore the divine victim immolated on the altar. You can see, touch, smell, hear, and even taste the presence of God during the Eucharist.
the Second Vatican Council, in the Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, says that the faithful should take part in the liturgy, being fully aware of what they are doing, being actively engaged in the rite, and finally enriched by its effects. During Mass, man can experience God right here on Earth. The quality of sacred art objects, music, and the architecture is therefore of paramount importance. We have just learned about sacred art and what makes it different from religious art. A similar division also exists between sacred music and liturgical music. We met with Monsignor Pablo Colino, Emeritus Maestro of the Chapel Choir of St. Peter's Basilica, to discover more about what makes sacred music liturgical. Not all sacred music or music inspired by sacred themes is liturgical. Liturgical music is connected with the rituals of the universal cult. In saying this, I actually find myself questioning whether all music that we think nowadays appropriate for the liturgy is truly liturgical music. And well, the music of the liturgy is set on the Church's teachings. It cannot be invented by, say, using a word that we don't really like, those at the lowest levels. It comes straight from the head of the Church, which holds the responsibility to educate us and raise us to salvation. More generally speaking, sacred music is any music that is inspired by the sacred. And it can be either sacred concert music or music of the liturgy. Sacred music is the genre, and the word of the liturgy is the difference. Liturgical music is something more than sacred music. Pope St. Pius X spent a lot of time and effort in the improvement of the music used in the liturgy. It is for this reason that Pius X is called the Pope of Sacred Music. He has been my inspiration. I believe that everything that all the popes after him ever said is based on what he said. He was the Patriarch of Venice and then came to Rome. We're talking about the early 1900s. In 1903, he wrote the Magna Carta on sacred music. And he has established the three principles that sacred music must have to be music of the liturgy. Before dwelling on these qualities, he said in broad terms, sacred music was created in order to praise God directly, not only indirectly as some say. No, to praise God directly and to edify the faithful. That is to say, their sanctification, education and enlightenment. All aimed at salvation, not any enlightenment of some other kind. St. Pius X said that sacred liturgical music must necessarily bring together three qualities. Well, so these three qualities that sacred music has to have to be used in liturgy. Firstly, this music has to stem from sanctity. It must be sound in the moral sense of the term. Secondly, it has to be good in its strictly musical form. That is to say, it has to be created by one who has studied and knows music and knows what folk music is, or Gregorian music, polyphony, contemporary music. It has to be created by someone who has been trained in all of this. Sacred music has to be music of good quality, not a monotonous chant. 
created by someone who doesn't know what a sentence is, a tone, the dominant tone, who doesn't know what breathing means or a riff, and above all, ignores the rules of accent and intonation. Accent gives life to words. And if you want to put something in music, you have to keep this aspect in mind, because the word accent means at cantus, which in turn means what makes it possible for a word to be sung. And well, this is the second quality of sacred music for the liturgy, that it is good music, that is, academic music, done by someone who is a professional. And to conclude, last but not least, the other very important third quality, and I've always liked the fact that a pontiff has put this down in writing, the universality of sacred music. These three qualities transform a piece of sacred music into music that can be the voice of God to us men here on earth. Throughout history, artists have often turned to religion for inspiration. A lot of masterpieces represent the divine world, Christian virtues, and stories from Holy Scripture. Christian art, which originated in the dark underground rooms of the Roman catacombs, gradually came out of them and spread beauty to the whole world. Many great artists were Christians. Michelangelo, Raphael, Caravaggio, Bernini. But over the past two centuries, art has changed its direction. If Christian art represented beauty intended to reveal God, the new currents have paved the way for a more abstract representation and more freedom of expression. In today's world, Christian art has often been relegated to exhibits in museums rather than being part of contemporary society. So is there any future for Christian art to be integrated into modern culture? A Canadian sculptor, Timothy Schmaltz, believes that not only did Christian art have a grandiose past, but that its future is immortal. Uh, as long as Christianity is out there, you will have artists like myself expressing it in different ways, uh, whether it be songs, whether it be paintings, or whether it be sculpture. And I think that today, uh, especially, we need to show the face of God. We need to show the, uh, the Gospels, unfold the Gospels in front of people. Um, there's so much different competition for people's attention nowadays. Um, it's it's a, a force that has to be presented in as many ways as possible. Art is an amazing tool. Timothy began to create sculptures at an early age. He tells us that when he was about 20, he lived in artistic conversion after which he started to devote most of his time to the creation of spiritual works that would celebrate Christianity. So I do believe that, that Christianity, Catholicism, is Western artwork up to the last hundred years. And what I'm trying to do with my artwork is bring that, that relationship between the arts and Catholicism even stronger and tighter together. Timothy was recently in Rome to conclude his project called Matthew 25. I created a sculpture of Jesus looking, looking like his words, how he presented himself in his words. What I did was I thought, well, I'll, I'll visually translate that very hardcore sacred part of Matthew 25 and I'll create sculptures of it. The project includes five sculptures situated in different places in Rome. Each sculpture challenges the onlooker to respond to the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. prison and you visited me. Outside Santo Spirito, we have, when I was hungry and thirsty, 
right at the entranceway. And that is a representation of what looks to be like uh, a, a beggar shrouded with clothing. But with a closer inspection, you'll see on the hand that it is indeed Jesus. Right beside is a cup and a plate to represent the, the food and, and, uh, and water, which uh, actually works very well within, within the environment. On the left-hand side of the entrance is the next statue, when I was sick and you visited me. And I always thought, how on earth do I sculpt that? When I was sick, you visited me into a sculpture. And it was all in the gestures of the piece. Uh, the figure has his hand over top of his face. He looks sick. He really looks like he's, he's suffering. And the other hand is reaching out. The face of Jesus is hidden and the statue represents all sick people. The visitor passing by the statue is thus reminded that by visiting the sick, he can really meet Jesus. And then you have, when I was naked, you clothed me. The sculpture was the most difficult one of the whole series to create because I thought, how do I represent Jesus naked here and suggesting the clothes? And actually, I was in Rome, uh, right near the Vatican, staying at my hotel and uh, I was looking out my window. Ironically, the hotel, it's a great hotel, it's called Vatican Views. But my, ho my view from my hotel was the homeless people sleeping in the window sill beneath across the street. And so all night long, I can't sleep because I'm excited I'm here in Rome. I'm, 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 I'm looking out at my view with these homeless people and I realized then how much they use cardboard as a very important part of their life. It's their pillows, it's their screen between the world and themselves. And I woke up in the morning and I realized that when I was naked, you clothed me, has to be a representation of Jesus naked. However, he's holding up a little piece of cardboard to shelter him, so he does look naked. And he has his one hand out, reaching for our attention and our compassion. This statue is in the portico of the Church of St. Peter in Chains. Here again, the face is covered and only the wound in one hand reminds us that the figure is actually Jesus. The next piece, When I Was a Stranger and You Welcomed Me, represents a traveler with a backpack. This piece is placed at the entrance of the 5th century Basilica of San Lorenzo in Lucina. He looks forlorn, but he's very heroic in his stance, and again, his face is obscured. That piece at St. Lorenzo in Lucina is at the entranceway of this historical church. It's a 5th century basilica, actually. And even today, homeless people gather in that portico waiting for uh, meals at the end of the day. So the, the, the history of that location for that sculpture is just absolutely amazing. The statue is a reminder that in every person who seeks shelter, we can see Jesus. And there's one last one that is at St. Uh, Paul's Basilica, St. Paul's outside the walls, they call it. And that piece there is um, when I was in prison, you visited me. And that sculpture, after I did the homeless Jesus, I thought, oh, it's one thing to uh, see Jesus in a homeless person. Everyone can understand what it's like to be poor. It's another thing to see, to see Jesus within a criminal. And it was a sculpture that was very difficult for me to do because I had to accept the message of Christ and not my own worldly attitude about, you know, criminals. And so it was medicine for me to do the sculpture. There I have the prisoner reaching, hold, holding the bar with his one hand and reaching his hand out asking for us to visit, asking for us to, to realize he exists. Timothy calls these sculptures a visual representation of the gospel. His project started in March of 2016 with the statue of homeless Jesus. Which is now installed uh, in front of the Papal Charities Building in the Vatican, but it's also being installed in uh, cities worldwide. I was just mentioning to you that uh, a homeless Jesus is being installed in the center of Moscow at St. Andrew's Church. Uh, there's one at the Catholic Cathedral in Singapore going to be outside. Um, there's another one in uh, the Jesuit-run church, the Holy Trinity Church in Johannesburg. So the homeless Jesus is finding homes all around the world and hopefully reminding people that all human life is sacred and that uh, 
uh, being a Christian, you have to accept these hardcore ideas to, to, see, to see Jesus within the least of our brothers and sisters. Before starting work on all of these statues, Timothy wondered how Jesus would want to be sculpted. And I thought Jesus wouldn't really be concerned about being the most beautiful person with the perfect ebbs and everything. He would want to be sculpted like his words, to express his words. And so I thought it's really, I think, coherent with, with the text to have it revealed his words not necessarily concerned about the beauty or the details of, of the, the face. Timothy is convinced that the gospel's truth should be presented to the people in a public space and at the places where people least expect to encounter Jesus. He also hopes that those who walk by these sculptures, even for just a couple of minutes, will stop and remember the gospel. Thanks for watching Vaticano. Join us next week for another edition.